Hey, this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science, a podcast for data science enthusiasts where I interview practitioners, researchers and calculators about their journey, experience and talk all things about data science. Chai Time Data Science has been a lot of things, a podcast to understand Kaglers, a podcast to understand how to get into machine learning, a podcast into the mind of great test mindsets in machine learning. For the last episode, I had to interview Emil Wallner. Emil is one of the best people and shares one of the best insights around self-learning learning through the internet, just being internet taught in the world of machine learning. He's currently working as an artist in residence at Google and has created some amazing projects, some amazing insights through his journey, through his online presence, which we dive into. Emil has had quite the journey. He has traveled a lot and has great and descended his way in life through different passions, eventually landing into tech and machine learning. We talk about that and how that caused all of these interesting chain reactions of all of the content and projects that he's created. So with that, and with with a huge thanks to each and every one of you who's tuned in twice a week for an entire year, listen to almost all of these episodes. Thank you for making season one worth it. Uh, This has been quite a journey. The podcast wouldn't end, but wouldn't follow this crazy schedule in the future. And this wouldn't have been possible without the amazing people like Emil, of course, but also the kind people like yourself that have been tuning in. Thank you so much from my soul for making this journey worth it. I hope you enjoyed this journey as much as I did. And now without further ado, here's the conversation. I am quite honored to be talking to Emil Wallner on the podcast. Emil, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. It's going to be great. Uh, so just off the record, we were talking about this. Uh, that's not a virtual background behind Emil. It's, it's quite literally his real background. <laughs> yeah, no, it looks like a Zoom background, but it, if you move fast, you can actually see it as real. <laughs> so uh, you, you've you had quite the fascinating journey Uh would love to start by talking about your journey in general. Uh, first, I heard about you became the chief of a village in Africa. Uh, can, can you share that story? Yeah, no, it's, it's a pretty wild story. Um, so it goes back to when I was 18. I moved to the countryside in uh, West Africa, Ghana. And I lived with a, a family there. It was more of a collective of people. So it was 14 of us. Um, and uh, what was interesting there is that all the, fi- all the food was made on open fire the water came from the well and like most people who lived in the region were farmers and I was kind of there volunteering in a school and um, while I was in the school there were other volunteers but then there was kind of a, a fight with the organization and they didn't send any more volunteers and all of a sudden I was alone in this village and I was the only foreigner in that area. Mm. And that became pretty tough pretty fast because I, I didn't realize this, but like just having a basic conversation with someone that comes from a completely different background is super hard because like I would go into kind of the Western statistic rational approach and they would always come from a, a more spiritual energy, dark energy uh, approach. So I would always kind of be in a clash in this conversation. I was trying to kind of teach them the basics of reasoning and statistics and it kind of never worked. So most people, once they had one conversation with me, they never really wanted to interact with me because I was kind of, even though I was nice and kind of open-minded, I still kind of try to force my world beyond them. And this, once you don't have any friends and you're in this kind of environment, things get hard pretty fast. Because at the time there were, I didn't have any cellular connections. There were no internet in the area. I didn't have a computer. I had like a journal and some books. Um, 
So when I start, I got started getting a lot of tropical diseases. So I had malaria twice. And a lot of these things kind of really wore me down. And when you don't have anyone to kind of just give you a hug or take care of you, things become really, really hard. And you kind of, I just started feeling this kind of brick wall approaching me. And I knew that I was uh, too stubborn to go back to Sweden. So I was like, there's only one, yeah, there's only one way to do this. And it's to figure out how to, to be in this village and be accepted. And the first approach there, I realized that I just can't talk. Like do the minimum to, to add value in the conversation. Just shut up, listen, ask open-ended questions, uh, and really kind of find small things that, that are playful and can give some value. That could be like playing with their local language. It can be do a gesture and kind of starting really small. And that turned to be pretty successful. I also kind of started engaging more in the community. So I went to the church. Uh, and in the church there, I started dancing. They invited me to weddings uh, and funerals because they loved me seeing me dancing there. Uh, and I got invited to all of these lovely, authentic experiences. And when I was invited there, I had more opportunities to connect with people and trying to really communicate with people and, and uh, create friendships. And I think that, that, that's when I had a period where I was really analyzing everything I said. So I think normally when you hear someone say something, you just automatically say what you was wanted to say but here i really had to kind of catch myself every time it's like why am i saying this where does this come from and always kind of hold back my automated thinking i, I call it my worldview habits um, and then but after this process people in the village started accepting me more and more and i think they saw a bit of a transition and the king who was in the region there before he had died and the spirit of the king was looking for a new host uh, so the villagers started like joking, like, hey, maybe, maybe you're the, our new king. And they started calling me Nanu, which means, means king, or Nanadama, which is the name of the village and, and kind of the title of the chief food. And so they started joking. And I was like kind of uh, a little bit surprised by it, but I thought it was funny. I was like, why, why not go along with it? And all of a sudden, my, my host mother, so the family I was living with, she said, hey, you need to come to a meeting. Uh, you need to meet the elders because we really need to discuss if you're going to be our new king. And uh, so I was invited to this kind of dark uh, little house. And there was three people, my host mother and two other people. And they started talking Twi, so that's the local language. And uh, they had like an intense conversation. I was sitting there a little bit surprised. And all of a sudden they stopped and they looked at me and they're like, so you're going to be our new king. Well, and, and, and I was like, yeah, I was really surprised. I was like, okay, so I'm your own king. So what does that mean? And the, and the first guy is like, yeah, we're going to do this the old way. So we're going to slaughter two goats. We're going to empty the blood. We're going to pour that over you. We're going to put you in a costume. We're going to get powder. We're going to carry you around the village. You're going to get four wives. And then you're going to have like a chief stool that's made of the, out of a wood that only chiefs can sit on. And from that point on, you're not supposed to move anywhere. Uh, and I was like a little bit terrified. I was like, wow, that, that sounds pretty intense. Uh, and then my host mother, she, she was like, took it down a little bit. She's like, I'm Christian, so we can't slaughter animals and give away wives like that. It's not about the, it's not in the ethos of Christianity. So she said like, we're going to do something more lighter. Um, but I was still, still sitting there super confused about, so I asked again, like, what does this actually mean? And she's like, but you know what you can do? You can just ask the king in Sweden. And he will tell you everything, what it means to be a king. And, and I could only imagine that conversation because we do have a king in Sweden, but I can imagine that a bit of weird conversation. But either way, I was sitting there super confused. They were looking at me. So like, do you want to be our new king? And then I was sitting, I was like, how many times do you get asked to be a king? Like, even though I'm not hundred percent sure what it means, I was like, yes. So I said, yes. And I was like, let's go for it. Let's just go with the flow. Let's just do this experience hundred percent. And so they made me the king. So they invited, they had a big ceremony and they invited all the neighboring kings or chiefs. Uh, they had a, a dance, the different offerings. They made the stool that we're talking about. Um, yeah, so that's the story. Yeah, it was, it's a, it was a real ride. Were you leading an army? Uh, were you leading the villages? How, how, how was your day-to-day -day like uh, once you became the king? Yeah, no, it was, it was uh, very, very surrealistic. Uh, so people started giving me gifts. Uh, they started seeing me as, as some kind of like 
kingly spirit. Uh, and yeah, well, I, I was still kind of had an order in life where I went to the, the school and I was still volunteering. So we didn't change that much, but it was, everything became just more confusing. Okay. Do you, do you still, uh, like you mentioned, analyze uh, your thoughts before speaking out or has it just become autonomous now? Do you just like uh, function like that now? Exactly. Yeah. So I think that the, my whiplash or kind of the biggest shock I had wasn't actually not when I was living there, but it was when I came back. Uh, and it was not so much that I, that I was analyzing my own thoughts and the context and why I was saying things, but I started hearing everyone around me. So it's like, if you build this kind of super detailed analysis and habit of, of kind of catching the automated reasoning, university statistics, this kind of Western mindset, you just started hearing it everywhere. And once you hear that, you, you just can't go back. It's like, you can't unhear it. And what happens is that you kind of go from a first world view to a third person world view. You kind of, instead of being all caught in all the ideas, you're kind of more looking at it and, and, and you're more objective towards the ideas. And the, the reason I'm, I'm uh, really enjoying diving into these is for anyone who follows oh. you on Twitter can can see your point of view in, in these interesting uh, nuggets that you share. And uh, even otherwise, your proximity to arts is quite visible uh, through your presence. Uh, I know some travel uh, followed uh, your stay in Africa as well. You did a bit of couch surfing. Any, any good memories from traveling? Uh, I, I read that you traveled quite a bit, couch surfed quite for quite a while. Yeah, no, so it was, it was after that, I think what, what happened is that I felt a bit cheated because I was like, I just became aware of kind of all of my automated thinking. And I was like, wait a minute, if this experience exposed me to, to so many things that I wasn't aware of, I'm sure there are other places, experienced people that can bring out other things that I, that I wasn't aware of. And it kind of comes from a, a quote by Henry Thoreau. He said that uh, like once, once you approach dying, you don't want to figure out that you haven't lived. So I kind of, that was my driving force to, to see the, the world. And so I lived with, I lived with mayors, I lived in poverty, I lived with millionaires, bankers, I lived in squats, mansions, pretty much anything that had a spectrum and some kind of unique character of the people living there, I tried to get myself into. And I think one, one uh, interesting experience was, was a little bit later, I was living in Nepal and this was actually during the earthquake. Um, so I lived in Pokhara, which is very close to the epicenter. And uh, I was living in the family and the, the man in the family, he had, uh, he was a former teacher, but now a farmer. And he had a daughter and a wife uh, and they were about to have the first son. And it was very dramatic because the, 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 my host mother, she was at the hospital the day before the earthquake. And they had a problem with the birth, so they had to make an operation. And it was, it was such a dramatic uh, period in their life. Um, but eventually it went well, and they had a son, and they kind of the Brahmin priest came and gave kind of the traditional birth ritual where they kind of give it the name and you, you put the feet in cow, cow shit. Uh, um, but I think for me, that was one of these moments where like I could have read hundreds of books about Hinduism culture or like the people living here but being here in this kind of moment like you just really experience it and like you really learn what it what it means like the culture and the context and I think that kind of takes me back to Richard Feynman he always says that you don't want to learn the name of thing you actually want to learn the thing itself and I think once you're traveling, one, it's all about this world you have, it's that you start developing it. But the other thing is that you just see the world in, 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 with your five senses. And that's absolutely amazing. That's very perfectly put. Um, in, in this pursuit of meaning and passion, were you always uh, driven to art? And uh, when did tech and education uh, made, made its uh, way into your interests? Yeah, so this, this is kind of a... Uh, I took a lot of different paths, path, and, and it might be hard to understand, but essentially I went through a phase where I, when you start deconstructing your mind and getting aware about everything that's going on, you eventually reach a phase where you kind of choose to, you can live more of a secular life, become a monk and kind of focus your life on meditation, um, or you can kind of choose 
desires, but you know that anything you choose will kind of create some sort of suffering. So you have to kind of be aware of that. Uh, and kind of, I, I still chose that I want to be active in the world. And kind of my main driving principle was like, how can I, how can I add value to the world? And what is my unique contribution? And uh, so I kind of went, I started with politics, but I realized that was, I didn't like that, um, neither working in it or, or the kind of idea of politics. I then headed into something called social entrepreneurship. Uh, so social entrepreneurship is the idea to use uh, entrepreneurship to drive societal change. So I was working at the business school at the University of Oxford. I think this was when I was around 22. And then there I kind of focused more, I realized within social entrepreneurship, I realized that education has, if you think about it, it's kind of the root of society and it kind of connects to everything. So if you can fix society or if you can work with education, you can make a lot of impact and especially education technology. So that's why I started the, the investment firm to invest in education companies. And it was me and my friend, I think it took about six months to boot, bootstrap the investment firm. Um, but, but kind of after doing that a couple of years, I realized I would rather be, instead of being on the investor side and analyzing things, I wanted to be on the maker side to actually create things myself, no technology, uh, and be more of an inventor rather than an investor. So w- when did you decide to pick the suffering of AWS builds? <laughs> when did you decide to start coding and start learning machine learning? Yeah, no. So I think in that phase, I started trying to build a company myself and I was paying developers and that became very expensive pretty fast. And I realized if I want to keep creating and doing stuff, I have to learn how to create things. And I still think that technology is the, one of the most powerful tools you can ever have. Um, and because I'd been an investor, my job there was to kind of analyze everything that was going on in education. So I had kind of a, a Excel sheet with about 10,000 10, different education companies and initiatives around the world. So I knew everything that was going on. And I knew that there was a school that was called 42. So when I had kind of more of a concrete desire to learn to program, I was like, how do I learn how to program? Hmm. Uh, and that's what kind of took me to Paris and 42. And what's unique about 42 is that they don't have any teachers. Uh, so you have to learn everything yourself. And then all the projects are marked through peer grading. So you make a project uh, and then you kind of randomly uh, have five people, your peers, to assess what you did. And uh, you, you've been quite critical of, let's let's call it traditional ways of education. Uh, what were the loopholes that you discovered uh, while while working as an analyst, as an investor, things that you didn't like about edu- the traditional uh, ways of education? Oh, wow. Well, I think there's, there, there's so many things. Uh, <laughs> uh, I... I think, I think when it comes down to it, like if you really look at what are the core components about learning, uh, I think kind of the best principle is something called space repetition. So it's the idea that you have to retrieve something from memory and you have to do it in space intervals. Uh, so a lot of people use something called flashcards, which kind of automate this process. But I think just like flashcard, you also have natural space repetition. So if you're building a project, for example, you're using a library, you have to use different syntax, you get to know the code. Same thing if you're writing something, it's like you're re-engaging with these ideas, you're retrieving it from memory and you really kind of, that's the, the kind of, that's how you learn or how the brain develops myelination or and synapses. And uh, if you kind of look at that process, like at the core and how you learn is kind of completely opposite and what they do at universities or, or education institutions. Uh, and you often see there, they're kind of, when you, when you ask people like, what's a learner? Uh, people will say like high school students or university students. But if you go to like a, a high school student, typical high school student, you'll see that they're on their phone, they're on TikTok, they're super <laughs> bored. And like the last thing they want to do is to, to, to learn things and do things. And I think a better metaphor for what a, a real learner is, is say a new parent who has a new kid or an entrepreneur or kind of a world-class performer that wants to get really good at something because they're really learning. They have to learn something because they're trying to create value. And I think for me, that's kind of the essence of learning and what it is, but that's just doesn't exist in the, in the university environment. I think uh, there was this debate in one of your tweets as well. Uh, people who go online from university are just there to learn and people who are self-taught go online to find ways of creating value, which also I found very insightful. 
Exactly. Yeah. So I think I think that's the kind of it's it's a different mindset because if you're in university, essentially you need to get a diploma or a degree to show that you have value. Whilst if you're a self-taught, you don't have that to rely on. So you need to have proof that you can create value, and that comes from creating things uh, versus universities. Yeah, it's all about the diplomas and the exams. Um. were there any struggles for you learning how to program many people have this i think at least in my opinion it's just this mental block that i need to know how to code in order to get started with machine learning which i think is still a small block and not as big as people make it so your thoughts yeah. on that yeah no i was i was fortunate to in in 42 it's it's kind of interesting when you apply to the school they have kind of a, a one month hunger game so they you have like 20 or 30 projects that you need to achieve every day you have like an automated exam on fridays you have weekend projects personal and in group on on weekends and all this is assessed and the best people get into the school uh so you're kind of forced to learn the basics of c and kind of you build the standard libraries uh and it's amazing like in just a short amount of time if you focus really hard and and you get into it you learn c and i i then we had more month where i kind of refine that and build more complex project but i think for me still i think c is a very lovely way to kind of get into a computer and it's a good abstraction level because you can both go down without be getting too confused and you can go up at several layers and because the mentality of kind of 42 is all about learning to learn like you learning to deal with all the frustration that happens when you're learning then when i kind of start shifting to machine learning Uh, it wasn't that much different because I was all, already learning by myself. I knew how to kind of take in information online and, and how to apply it to things. And in this in this pursuit of as it changed towards machine learning, you came up with these interesting uh, one of your tweets is titled "AI Auto Didact Degree." All of the tweets I mentioned will be there in the show notes for the audience. And you also came up with how you can uh, bootstrap yourself into the world of deep learning. How did you? find these parts how did you define these because these are very nicely put what thoughts went into it yeah i think i think one of the the key problems when you're you're learn by yourself is like there's so many things that you can learn and like what do you optimize for and i think in the beginning when you're starting out everything is just so confusing it's like the framework is terminology math calculus and algebra <laughs> there's so many things that you're it's just very confusing and uh, so what i realized there is that you need to have a goal some kind of uh, to narrow everything down so a good example is that if you're making a contribution to say pytorch uh, if you just focus on that small goal you're not only learning about the pytorch framework but you also learn about back propagation you learn about gradients you learn about layers how to build them you can also compare pytorch to other frameworks so it kind of gives you a way uh, to see the world uh, and like to to kind of put everything into context and so the, a few of the things i put is for example like you can make a contribution to a library as i said or you can make an, a, a small business or a project you can create a paper uh, and all of these projects that you choose are kind of you have to decide where do you want to go and choose the projects accordingly uh, but again it's all about this this process that I was saying earlier like space repetition is like you want to engage use your knowledge repeat it over and over so that it really sticks and i think that's that's the only way to really do that were there any points uh, and i i think all of us would struggle at some point in learning with imposter syndrome or just having the motivation especially when you just learning yourself uh, following a spreadsheet did you face that or was it always natural for you uh so i think it was uh yeah this there's kind of this motivation component and the the imposter syndrome component and the motivation i think absolutely i think most people are taught something called string in, intrinsic motivation so that we have kind of external rewards uh, such as titles degrees grades mm-hmm. and that's kind of our our go to to way of of being motivated and most people can spend like a few weeks on on something they want to do because we just don't have the motivation or the training to, to do that 
And, and there's, there's a really lovely book by, I think it's called De Daniel Pink and it's called Drive. And it's kind of all about how to build intrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation, if it comes down to it, is autonomy. So you want to do something independent, uh, it's mastery. So you want to work on a skill that you want to improve and then there's purpose. And you want to feel that what you're doing actually has a broader purpose. Uh, and these things are hard to develop. And you kind of, you just have to sit down with yourself and then you'll like procrastinate like hell. You will uh, <laughs> like check Twitter, you'll have imposter syndrome. And then what, I, what I've done, done kind of the practice is that the day after I sit in the morning, I kind of write for 10 minutes, like what went well yesterday? What can I do better today? And I think building self-motivation, it's not something you can build in a year or two. It's kind of this slow process that takes five to 10 years. Uh, but once you, you start developing this uh, intrinsic motivation, it kind of builds and becomes stronger and you can do amazing things. But I, I still procrastinate and it's, it's still hard to focus, but it gets a lot better. Um, and I think in terms of like the impulsive syndrome that comes with the self-learning is, um, I think that's, everyone has impulsive syndrome. It's like the default mode of the brain. If you just sit still for 10 minutes and kind of let the daily chatter disappear, the first thing that's gonna <laughs> pop up is like, why am I here? What am I doing? Am I, what am I worth, etc. cetera? And um, I think what I realized there is that it's, it's, it's a quote that I really like. It's, uh, what is it again? Uh, yeah, it's needing nothing attracts everything. Hmm. And it's kind of, um, once you really start living that kind of quote, things change. Because in the beginning, I was kind of, I need, I need a job. I need to work at these prestigious firms. And as soon as you kind of, it becomes a bit of a lottery. It's like you're taking shortcuts and like you apply to these firms. And then when you get denied, like you just feel so bad. It feels horrible. And you kind of, you just, because when you get declined, you, move, you lose maybe like three or four months of focused work because you're kind of just dealing with emotions of kind of rejection. And so early on, I realized if I want to work in machine learning and technology, I just need to have this mindset of like, I'm going to do this no matter what. Um, like if I had to live with my parents for a while or my grandparents or like whatever it takes to learn it, I'm just going to learn it slowly and steadily and kind of the way that I think adds value. And what you often see is that if you don't take any shortcuts, if you just focus every day on like, how can I learn as much as possible, eventually you will start building a, a kind of momentum. And as soon as you have a bit of momentum, you can, you can often kind of keep that momentum going instead of kind of having to depend on this kind of lottery and imposter syndrome that comes from it. That's, I think, one, one point that most of uh, the people struggle with. They, they're just looking for how can I become a practitioner in six months? How can I become a data scientist in six months? And honestly, I don't think there are any shortcuts. You will end up learning whatever you needed to afterwards as well with, with a lot more uh, of imposter syndrome kicking in. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, there's, there's so many courses that offer these kind of shortcuts uh, and I, I fully agree with you. It's like, there's not a lot of shortcuts. I think there's, there's definitely efficiency in what you focus on. Uh, so I think there, for example, is that like most people who take a degree and they study five years, a lot of that can be condensed down into six months. So you can learn something, it's money. You can actually get a job. Uh, you will learn something completely different, but you will actually have a paying job and you're going to pay to learn instead of having to pay, pay back debt in, in the future. I was uh, just, I, I think, talking to one of my managers that I, I had assumed the learning stops before you join a job. But uh, that's that's one of the things that's most amazing about this field is you continue learning even while at work. Exactly. I, I think it's the complete opposite. As soon as you come in an environment and you have real problems, real people, that's when you have to learn to become efficient. That's when you start developing your best practices. And also once you have... I think in the beginning, most people want to kind of jump to, to the best jobs. And it becomes uh, like most, it's really hard to get into this, especially if you're like a self-taught person, uh, because like 99% of these app applicants will be university students. And so all of these companies have kind of geared their hiring towards that. 
And it's completely different from the skill set that someone has who's self-taught. So often people who apply to these firms get rejected because it's just not a match there in terms of how they hire. And I think what's much better is to like try to get a job as fast as possible. As you said, you learn so much at the work. Uh, and the key thing there is like, do your very best every day. And if you get better and better every day and you show it, you talk about it, you, you will eventually lead to better opportunities. And I think having that momentum, having that kind of forward motion is so important early on. The first code review at work will teach you a lot more than all of the projects you would have done by learning by yourself, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I fully agree. So this uh, constant learning loop that people who are just relying to the internet uh, to study, they're just going from one course to the other. It has happened a lot with me. I know many people uh, who get stuck in this loop. How, how, how do you suggest they snap out of it? How do they become focused more on creating value or creating some project? Because there's always this marketed courses being thrown at you, which make you feel, oh, you need to learn X, then Y, then Z. And uh, you, you're just stuck in that loop. Exactly. And I think, I think that comes from kind of the education mindset that we're all brought up with. And uh, again, it's like these people are selling you things. They're selling you courses. They want you to pay for it. They don't care what you do. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the thing there again is like, if you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contribute to PyTorch. And if you have that as your sole goal, and that, that's what you want to achieve, like taking five different machine learning courses is probably not really going to help you to, to contribute to PyTorch, it's going to be more like, I'm going to learn the syntax. I'm going to start looking at the issues. What are the kind of refactoring areas that I can look into? Uh, and again, I think as soon as you have a very, very concrete goal that you want to do, like you narrow your focus and you actually learn things that, that add value instead of adding these like million things that you might use in the future. Absolutely. Uh, this brings me to another tweet. So we're sort of analyzing your tweets, trying to get your uh, thoughts of the, the thoughts you had while tweeting these out. It's titled Machine Learning Portfolio Tips. Uh, we would love to dive into that and uh, get an understanding of your general uh, tips today. So yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great, great tweet. And I think it still has uh, a lot of value. And that was kind of my analysis of the work I was doing when I was learning. I, I kind of synthesized that to what were the principles that, that worked. Uh, and the first one there is kind of finding a unique idea. And most people are exposed to the same idea. We follow the same people on Twitter, we read the same feeds. And when we come up with these kind of gut ideas, they all tend to be the same. They always feel unique, they always feel valuable, but, but they're almost always the same. And kind of the first step there is that to have unique ideas, you need to consume unique sources of information and that might be papers that are 10 years old. It might be uh, like Kaggle forums or kind of different venues that people don't normally consume. Um, and then kind of the second part that I was kind of hinting on is this uh, idea kind of intoxication that you get in love with your ideas that you have. And often these ideas tend to be really bad. It's the, as I said earlier, it's the ideas that everyone have. And if you write about or do something, no one's going to care because that's kind of what everyone else is doing. Uh, but what I find a lot more effective is to take kind of the research approach. In the end, having a good idea is all about putting in the hard work. It's not about being a genius or being smart. It's all about like what's, what's out there and what can I work on? And I think there are two constraints that I, I thought was very useful is to look at what are students making? Because mm. students often have the constraint of compute power and also knowledge. They have limited knowledge and compute power. And there's like thousands of papers coming out by students every year. And no one reads these. Like, not as, like they might have like the authors, but except from that, there might be like one or possibly two people reading these. And these are actually a gold mine of ideas that you can start analyzing. So kind of in the tweet, I say that like make a short list of 100 projects. So choose 100 projects that you think are has a lot of potential uh, that you don't think is fulfilled right now. And then once you've done a short list and analyze it, you kind of want to look, the final decision once has to be a gut instinct. It's like both what is actually working and, and what do I enjoy working on? Uh, so I call it like reason first and gut last. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and then exactly, because yeah, the idea of analyzing ideas it's, it's easier because if you're analyzing other ideas, you're critical, whilst if you're analyzing your own ideas, uh, they become 
you, you're way too biased. Uh, and then what, what, what's the, do you have the tweet up there? I do. Uh, it's uh, identify knowledge gaps and fill them and repeat. Oh yeah, yeah. This is a good one too. So I think a lot of people are stressed. They feel like they have to be somewhere in, in some place that they're not. And if you look at like Jeremy Howard and like a lot of the big thought leaders in tech, they kind of, they had one message and that's like, do one thing really well. Like that's, if you do one thing really well, you're set. And, and that takes time. So like most people will feel frustrated after they read a paper. Uh, but this is, it's this beautiful uh, thread on Reddit where uh, I think it's a PhD advisor from Germany who says kind of, don't worry, just kind of, when, once you read a paper, you, you will have gaps. Take the time and fill them. And if you look at that from kind of a learning perspective, we have something called cognitive uh, overload. As soon as we try to have seven novel concepts in our brain, give or less, uh, it's hard to, to cope more concepts. So what happens when there's too many novel concepts, we just feel confused, we feel useless, and we kind of get into this impulsive syndrome. But, but really how it works is that you, you, you just can't only learn a certain amount of things in a day. So focus on like, what are seven things that you don't know? Learn those things. And then the next day you realize like, wow, I actually understand more high level ideas now because I understand the lower level ideas. And if you just keep in reading, I could read a paper for several weeks. I just get in the morning, I read to where I understood, I take notes. And again, it's like, take your time, your students, you have time. Don't feel like you have to stress everything, like take the time that it needs. I think, uh, and that's, that's why the earlier part of our conversation, just having intrinsic motivation and not being stressed by having a deadline, you can't become a good researcher in six months. People take 20 years, even more than that. Uh, the greats are still doing their research. Uh, the godfathers are still doing their research. Just having those values is also very helpful, I think. You see, I, I think that, that's also like a common, uh, like something I struggled with in the beginning. It's like, I didn't know the difference between a research scientist, a research assistant, a residentship, machine learning, software, DevOps. I mean, there's so many different things that are kind of part of the same family. And again, I think like a research scientist, it takes at least probably five or 10 years to develop the understanding, to come up with these interesting ideas. Uh, and that's something that you need to gradually build. And that's also why I kind of recommend machine learning engineering as a starting point for everyone. Even if you are a self taught person who wanna do research, I think like getting into developing machine learning models, learning the best practice, getting all the nitty gritty details is just going to make you a more efficient researcher follow like down the line. Plus you will have money resources and you will gain knowledge that you can use further on. Definitely. Uh, so in, in this tweet storm of yours, uh, you have general tips around how you can create content around this uh, blogging also comes next as another tweet storm of yours would love to dive into your uh, current or just general advice to writers and I'll have the tweet open here for the audience. Exactly. Yeah. So I think, I think that's again, one of the most underrated areas in the world is kind of writing because you can just access millions and millions of people. Uh, and, and once you start realizing the power of that, it, it becomes very addictive and very powerful. Yes. Um, and, and in the, in the tweets from there, I, I start again by kind of emphasizing, like start on the idea. Uh, find something that's interesting, do the research, categorize things uh, and have an objective perspective of what's actually working and build from there. Uh, and I kind of split it into like 30, 30, 30, 10. So 30% finding idea. So if you have about say three months, you want to spend a full month finding an idea. Hmm. Most people like they rush it, they do it like they take a good idea, they do it on a weekend. But like this is a process like spend a month, like really figure out what's going on, categorize things, summarize things, and, and then kind of the second step is like writing the code. So you, you can start by doing prototyping different things and choose the most promising one. And then the 30 parts where you write about it. And when you're writing about it, I think again, when you come from an educational mindset, you, you often come from kind of the format approach. So I, I remember when I, I used to wrote an essay when I was young, I thought it was amazing and it would just come back with red marks everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 yeah, and I, I, I never wanted to write again. And I think that's so wrong because in the real world, it's all about ideas and values. It's like, so a smart person who sees a very interesting idea and a project, 
they will engage with it. If there's some some grammar mistakes or the story or the writing is not very compelling, that's kind of a, that's that's okay. You kind of buy see that. But if you write about something that's boring, but in a good way, no one's going to oversee that. No one's going to spend time reading something boring, even though it's super well written. Uh, and I think. I really want to encourage people, if you find a product that's amazing and write about it, you will have traction. Uh, so the last part of that is kind of 10% spending it on marketing. And this is an approach that kind of people can, it's a little bit hard in the beginning if you're a creator to put your stuff out there because you're, you're getting judged by ideas and it feels very foreign. But again, the good part there is that if you make something that's not very good, no one's going to care about it. And like, yeah. you're going to feel bad, uh, but, but like all these algorithms works in a way that it's just going to disappear in the flow. And, and it's, I think I heard on a podcast, like someone asked, like, can you tell me all about the, the bad ideas that you read about last week? And I'm like, well, I, I can't remember a single one because it's like, you just kind of delete it from your memory. Uh, so it's kind of publishing things online always has a more of a positive reward, no matter what happens. And again, something I see there is that when you look at student project, especially people tend to kind of just put the code in the repo and then they have a readme and then like one line run this command and like, <laughs> and, and they, they expect people to kind of look into the code, read the source files and no one, literally no one does that in, unless it's an acceptable project and you want to understand more. Uh, and again, I emphasize there in kind of the, the, the tweet that you want to you want to do the work for the audience. You want to do the work for the reader. And I think it's like there's 30 plus 30. So you have 30 seconds to, to get people their attention and engagement. And then you have kind of 30 seconds to get people up and running. So you need like a column notebook, runaway ML, anything we can just click and people can see if what you've done is actually interesting or not. And the beautiful part that you mentioned in there, out of all the other things, that, uh, one thing that stands out to me is uh, that it's 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 a 24-7 process after you've done it. If it's good enough, I stopped writing when I was close to 800,000 views. Uh, the next views, the exact double amount just came afterwards. I had essentially stopped writing after that, but it it the algorithms kept sending, I, I guess, bots or whatnot to to the blogs. Exactly. You know, that that's the amazing part is like it's it's content that's working for you 27. When you're sleeping, it's finding people like online on the other side of the world. And that's also literally how I got all my opportunities is because I wrote this thing. So like the serendipity there with Google, I think is interesting is that I, I literally created this model. It's like 150 lines of code, super simple Keras code, and it colorizes these images. And, uh, What's, what's funny there is it's a very simple and basic project, but I, I spent a lot of time kind of communicating and making it look good. And then someone at Google, like a year later, saw this article and was like, wow, this is amazing. He's using Keras, his TensorFlow is relevant for our company. Uh, this is a lovely project that kind of the public can relate to. Uh, so they asked me to do a video about this, this project. So they made a video, I think I don't know, one or two years back. And uh, they made this video and then other people at Google saw this video and was like, hey, he's actually doing this. This is very interesting. He, he might be able to add value to what we're doing uh, in the lab. So, so I think these things, it's a little bit weird and you're kind of trusting faith a bit, but oftentimes it, it really pays off. Uh, like you said, it just keeps compounding. And uh, there's also some... Uh... I think many people find it cheap uh, to market their projects, but it's a necessity to just get yourself out. There are a lot of people on this podcast. They just try to request. Uh, actually, they're kind enough to reach out to me to offer their time. I, I should put it like that, just to share about their projects. And I'm I, they're always welcomed on the podcast. I don't monetize this, but I, I know many other content creators as well who would love to amplify st such stuff so it's, it's just a matter of reaching out because as far as I know no one usually says no to amazing projects exactly I, I think that's the kind of it's a core skill set and, and with the days with like Twitter social media all these different uploading platforms I think if you want to be a creator I think it's it's a part of the skill set that everyone needs to have so uh, 
how did you come up with this idea of let, let's let's talk about both screenshot to code and colorizing images how did these originate and how was the journey from the inception of the idea to having the repo completely published out there yeah no so it's it's uh what when i wrote the other tweet about kind of formalizing this approach it's it was obviously kind of more romantic and more uh, organized than the actual approach the actual approach is often more messy it's weird you're exploring a lot of different directions but i had roughly the similar approach where i did make a sheet with a lot of different projects i did analyze them uh, in in different ways and i think i remember in the beginning when i was doing this keras model and i just felt so weird about moving these big vectors and concatenating them and i was like I was like, is this even possible? It's like, I'm putting these like massive like feature vectors together and it just works. I'm like, uh, like should I look into the code to make sure that all the numbers are correct? Uh, and I would, I would sit like days and procrastinate on like one or two lines of code because I was like, can I really do this? It's like, it, just, <laughs> it felt so foreign and weird in the beginning and like this most bizarre way. It's like, it's only a couple of lines of code, but it's like, it just feels so heavy with these different dimensions and data and concatenating and, and you do have to understand how they're put together to, to reach the desired outcome um, and then like i spent these projects both took about two to three months each and both of them are student projects uh, so one is from uh, i think one project i think both of them might be from denmark no one is from sweden and one is from denmark um, and, uh, and these were great because they were, if you look at conversation at the time, most people had applied it, but they had only done these kind of academic approaches. Mm. Uh, so the image they choose were ImageNet and they were really boring. I was like, hey, if I just apply these to kind of more modern photography and make it interesting visually, it, it, it will attract a broader audience and make it more appealing. And so I think that was the... the when you're doing this project, you always want to have a little bit of an X factor. You want to figure out how can I do this that it will stand out compared to everything else. Uh, and the second project there was the, the screenshot to code, which is based on a paper called Pix to Code. Uh, and again, there it was, it was a very lovely project and this super neat idea where you can kind of, you take the, the CNN features and translate them to LSDM features and, and you produce code. So you take a design markup and, and create code. And this is just such a lovely, neat idea. Uh, and there was this paper, uh, but again, reading this paper, it was very hard to understand for the broader public. Uh, and there were, there were things that could be made more simple and more approachable. So again, I was working with that. I, I tried some new things. I proved it a little bit. Uh, and, I, and I wrote about it and I remember showing this uh, to one of my friends early on. I was like, I just want to show you what I did here. And I like, clicked enter and kind of showed the program. And he's like, <laughs> oh, he's like, what's going on? Like, this is crazy. And I was like, once you're in a project, you kind of, you don't really realize the potential of it. And you kind of you, you still have this impulsive syndrome even when i launched the article i was like is this really good i don't really know it's it's uh but then once i launched it it, it really took off um and i had like a, a little bit more than a million views in different platforms and uh yeah it, it was very exciting but also super weird like once you have your first viral tweet and, and the internet kind of comes at you it's it's <laughs> yeah, it's, it's weird also want to point out that uh, the content that you created around it, I'll have uh, the blogs linked. I'm sure you put in a good amount of time there as well in even just creating the right GIF for the tweet that goes out with it and tweets are just 280 characters. But if you draft them nicely, uh, the machine learning community can be very generous to everyone. And you've, you've also mentioned this in one of your tweets. I, I think, yeah, it's, it's one is writing, but realize more and more GIF creation is a skill set. Um, <laughs> uh, like also I have an art project now called ML Art where I kind of curate different uh, creative projects. And I realized there's so many projects that they kind of expect you to spend 30 minutes to an hour to really look at like a film that's 20 minutes long or lead a text that's five or 10,000 words. And there might be like one or two paragraphs or kind of a key scene in this movie that's so interesting. But because it's kind of, 
it has all this context around it, most never kind of come to that point to see that gem in the project. And I think that's the same thing when you're doing anything. It's like you want to try to figure out what's the gem in my project. And when you're, once you're doing a tweet, it's like you have a few seconds when you're doing that GIF to get people excited initially. Absolutely. Um, so speaking in general, what does a day in your life at uh, Google currently look like in, in a non-pandemic version of the world? Uh, how, how does your day look like? Yeah, so I would say that at heart, it's not very different from what it was before in the sense of how I work and how I do things. Uh, I mean, at Google, you have different roles. You have software engineers, you have machine learning engineers, uh, and I'm more kind of in the creative coder a residentship uh, part of it and that allows you to have a lot more freedom it's more focused on kind of r d we still have to add value to the the main organization but it, it you can do a lot of different things and being part of the the google ecosystem is a little bit overwhelming at first because you think it's like one company but you realize it's just like it's like a small city with companies inside of it and uh, so in the beginning you're often very overwhelmed by all the kind of words, the tools, uh, and also the offices and the places that you will be in. It's, it's just so, so amazing that you're kind of taken by, back by that. Like I went from 42, which is kind of a, a very uh, industrial building, like floor by floor. And I was kind of eating porridge and powder food. And then I came to Google and their offices and it's like, they have these amazing buffets and you can have like a breakfast buffet, you have like baristas and all this stuff. And for me, that was like overwhelming. It's super weird the first couple of months. For anyone listening, I've mentioned this multiple times. If you get to interview at Google, even though if it goes well, eat, overeat as much as you can, eat five ice creams, you won't regret it. Trust me, if, even if they reject you. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, no, preparing and learning everything is always, always a plus. Yeah. Um, there are a few questions from uh, the Twitter AMAs around combining machine learning and art. So would love to just ask your thoughts in general. Uh, what are the interesting areas to you and uh, what promises do you see in combining machine learning and art? Uh, so what I like between machine learning and art is kind of, I look at, if you look at art from, from a broader perspective, you will have this kind of time periods. I, I, I'm reading a book about kind of the Renaissance painters, which is very lovely. I can't remember the name, uh, but you have one idea there that they don't really understand. But before they made these realistic paintings, it was kind of all these more Greek symbols. And um, so even making realistic paintings was kind of a, a change in the aesthetic and how things were made. And I think for me that that's the most interesting part is like how is machine learning changing how we do things? It's like, how is it changing the aesthetic? And I think what we've seen there, it has been very visual so far. So like guns have been a, a key player, both in conditional guns, style gun, uh, and so on and so forth. And I think what it has done is it's really developed this unique aesthetic and it's brought out a lot of ideas and there's like a recent project where they create monsters uh, i think the one made by google and one made by nvidia but it, the fun part there was that they generated i think it was a guy who worked in the movie industry and he could generate all these weird kind of monsters and what was nice that often these kind of latent vectors created monsters that he couldn't even imagine so it mm -hmm. kind of gave him ideas uh, to build on and develop these uh, monsters for his movies. And I think that's, for me, what I find interesting is like, what are the things that allow people to do something they haven't done? And I think in audio uh, or in video, or like mostly audio, I would say that there have been some interesting ideas, WaveNet, MuseNet, uh, Magenta, DDSP, uh, but we still haven't had that kind of gun moment where the entire music industry is starting to adapt these technologies and you kind of start hearing on a regular basis songs that are machine learning inspired. But I think eventually that will come and that will be very interesting. If you ever uh, create something similar, I'm sure the people can find you on Twitter. Um, my final question usually is a repeat one. Uh, your best advice, broadly speaking, uh, to someone who's just starting their journey. Yeah, no, so I'll, I'll take back that kind of couple of things that we discussed today. And I think the first one is if you're really young, you really want to develop these worldview habits. 
you want to meet people and kind of have your ideas be contrasted with other people and really to get to know who you are. Um, and then I think the second part is build kind of finding a purpose and also the skill set that you want to develop. And like I probably tried 20 or 50 different occupations. So try machine learning. If you don't like it, try software engineering. Like there's so many ways, like never feel stuck, always be on the move. Um, and I think there, especially if you're a self-taught person, I was discussing this earlier, is that you want to build momentum. So either you can build momentum or you can have this kind of lottery and imposter syndrome approach. And for me, like moving forward, like in the beginning when I applied for jobs, like I applied for hundred jobs, uh, like no one got back to me. And I was like, wow, should I really do this? But I was like, I really want to do this. I should probably, instead of applying to these known companies, I should approach smaller companies, uh, pitch them with a specific uh, value package that I can create for them and really just get going, start adding value um, and start producing stuff and not kind of just learn for two years and put all your chips that you can get into a famous company. Because if you don't, it's just, can be very demoralizing and they're like, like I've seen a lot of people because I'm I was surrounded with about four thousand learners back and forth. I saw a lot of people trying to get into the industry, and often what I saw is that people aim a little bit too high. They get rejected, and then they often kind of switch to software engineering. And I think software engineering can be a good way into machine learning, but it can also be very easy to get kind of stuck once you're a software engineer. It can be hard to make the transition. Um, so I think like really get going and build that momentum. And I would say that the kind of the final advice uh, is kind of choose your own path. I think there is, there is so many people that are kind of doing the standard ways. And I think if you want a rich and diverse society that's more resilient, that take more risks uh, and kind of choose who they want to be in the world. And, and I think that's a good, good place to end. Uh, that's one of the best advices uh, to end the conversation on. But I have a small uh, rapid fire set of questions. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sure. 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 Um, best scheduling or efficiency hack that you found in, in your pursuit? Oof. Uh, I have a recent hack that I uh, developed is that I realized that hacks don't really work because as soon as you have a hack, you have this, it comes from the idea that you can kind of outsource your willpower. It's like, I used to block different websites. I used to have mm. like all these different kind of procrastination hacks. But then again, I realized the only way to deal with this is to kind of minimize everything and set rules. So now I have like a big Excel sheets with rules. So it's like, I can check my emails three times a day. So every time I check an email, I put like one, uh, I need to, exercise every day. So I have this kind of way to keep track of it. And I realized that's a lot more powerful. It's like, you don't have any blockers, you don't have any limits, but you do, you do have rules and that you do follow. Okay. Why delete LinkedIn? Oh, oh LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, so I think that, again, that comes down to kind of the productivity hack is like, if you have a lot of different not notifications, and, and platforms, you just allow yourself to be distracted more. So I kind of took a very constant decision. It's like, what are the things that I really need and what's creating distraction? So I think Twitter for me is essential, but like Facebook, for example, I deleted, Instagram, I deleted, LinkedIn, I deleted. Um, and LinkedIn, I think if you're getting your first job, it might be some value. Uh, but once you've had a job or two, I find it highly distractive. There's like, you're getting a lot of opportunities and people reaching out to you. And once you, that's kind of the biggest trap. It's like you get a notification and then you're stuck in the feed. Uh, and I think this is a horrible combination. So if I can avoid a feed and notifications in any way possible, I do that. Makes sense. Uh, let's, let's try asking a few more difficult questions. Uh, favorite art form or artwork that you have ever come across? Oh, so I like, I'm, uh, my latest that I find very inspiring is, uh, uh, a picture that's made with a gun, but without a data set. Uh, I think his name is Terence Board. And what was interesting there is that it's kind of these two guns that create an image together and they synthesize it from scratch. 
Um, and what's, I think the potential there is very interesting. I think we've seen early in the com computational arts is that, for example, Conway's Game of Life, you can create these amazing, beautiful patterns. But with neural networks, you can create even more visual and interesting patterns. And I think the fundamental interesting idea there is that if you create this synthesized statistic, what's that going to look like? Is that going to re resemble the kind of aesthetics and the, the shapes and things that we have in our kind of natural environment? Or are these models going to be able to create new shapes and patterns that we're not familiar with? Okay, that sounds very fascinating. Um, favorite city or village that you travel to? Favorite travel experience? Ooh, there's so many. Like every <laughs> every travel has such a unique story, and uh, I, I can I think oh, there's so many to choose from. But I, I really liked. Uh, I had a very a very peaceful time in Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, so I rented like a house by the, the, in the, on the countryside and I was like, I had this amazing view and what was cool about it, like I used to run in the morning and you had penguins running on the beach. I came back to my house and I would like sit and read in the grass and I had like this giant sea turtle come up like next to me and start eating my t-shirt. Uh, and I just had these like, it's so beautiful down there and like having that peace and that moment in the nature was at the time, it just felt amazing. Sounds amazing for sure. Favorite book of all time? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite book of all time. Uh, I think that uh, there's so many books I could recommend. I think somehow something that formed my identity early on is it's my name is Emil and, and there's a, a famous author called Astra Lindgren uh, who's a children author in Sweden. She, and she wrote a book about Emil who's naughty. It's like about this naughty boy. And somehow in Sweden, like everyone kind of relates you to this character. Uh, and, and she made a book. And when I was little, I always used to have that under my pillow. And it was kind of super dear to me because I was like, I didn't like it because people were making fun of me, but it was still part of my persona. Uh, yeah. Okay. Final one. Uh Favorite chai, or if you don't drink chai, uh, drinking experience in any country? Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a big fan of chai. I actually used to study, at, uh, I was in uh, Ahmedabad. So I took some courses there at the design school there, and uh, I drank a lot of good chai there. It, it's so nice when they kind of have these small cups on the street. Mm. Uh, they're, they're, they're so amazing. Um, but I would say right now I'm drinking uh, Danish coffee. So I don't know if you know about what a Nordic roast is. Well, not, so, not a lot. So they, they kind of, the Nordic country starting with doing a very lightly roasted coffee bean. Uh, and it's kind of known as the Nordic roast. And they're a little bit more acidic. Uh, it's kind of the idea that if you roast it too much, you can only taste the roast. But if mm. you only roast it lightly, a lot of the taste in the coffee. So you need to pick beans that are super, super high quality because the taste come out a lot more. Uh, so this one is from uh, the Coffee Collective in Denmark. I think if you want some kind of light, fruity coffee that's a Nordic rose, I think that's a good place to buy them. Okay. Uh, Emil, you're Emil Wallner on Twitter as well as Emil Wallner on GitHub. Uh, any other platforms where people can find you? No, I think I, I think my Twitter account is kind of the, my main channel and then everything kind of goes up from there. Please find him on Twitter at ML Wallner, Wallner is spelled with double L, uh, also in the show notes. Thank you so much again, ML, for your time and for all of these insights that you keep sharing with us and the community. Yeah, thank you. It's been a very lovely time. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.